It looks like Mr. Schnee made it. Okay, great. All right, it looks like we are now live. So it is 8.30, we're gonna go ahead and get the meeting started. So welcome everyone to the Hartford County Delegation meeting this morning, February the 2nd. Um, I'm gonna open us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. And may as legislators, we have the wisdom to pass legislation that benefits the citizens of Harford County and beyond and bless those in attendance in your name, amen. And then I'm amen. gonna have Delegate Griffith to um, start us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Delegate Griffith. Okay, um, again, welcome everyone. This is a note, <clears throat> excuse my voice, everyone, I'm getting over sickness here. So, as a note, Everyone, as a delegation, everyone receives a letter from the county executive um, with his liquor board appointees. Uh, the date of the letter was the first, um, and of course, that was after the date the agenda um, was put out. So I need you to look at those individually. If you would like to contact the, the appointees, we will give you a little bit of time to do that. Um, but we do need via email your um, position, whether you approve the appointees or you disapprove the appointees. And that needs to become, it needs to come to the Hartford County delegation email by Monday at noon. And then the delegation will come up with its letter um, to, and send that to the county executive. Um, that we, So, because if we wait until the eighth, which is our next delegation meeting, I think is the eighth or 10th, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's past the seven days. So, um, he, the information you have, look it over and then just send us an email because it's basically just confirmation uh, anyway. So I think we have done that in the past um, with an email vote and the senators will do the same on their own and the delegation with house delegation will do the same on our own. So if you could have that to Judy um, Monday by noon so we could get that uh, to the county executive. Um, again, we have uh, here to testify for the liquor board, so I won't have to keep going through liquor board. We have Paul Majewski and we have Mike Krabs um, will be doing the um, introductions on the bills that they're here for. Um, again, as mentioned, and also in the minutes, we are going to move um, the new business at the top um, because that's kind of where we left off. And then we will then conclude with the old business in order of how we've been discussing the bills. Uh, so the bills that we've already had a couple days discussion, discussion on already or at the end, the ones that we had just one day of discussion or possibly um, had to cut off, um, we'll start with those first. And then uh, most likely all of these uh, we'll probably have to hold over um, for our last day next week. Um, for um, voting. Again, if we have time today to get some of them um, banged out, we will do so. Um, I need, first of all, um, Vice Chair McComas to make a motion uh, to approve the minutes for 119 and 126. We can do that, them together. Delka McComas, uh, you're, you're muted. Uh, so move uh, to approve the, the minutes of uh, 119 23 and 126 23. Thank you, Vice Chair McComas. And I need a second. Second. Johnson. Steve. Okay. Thank you, Steve, uh, Delegate S. Johnson, uh, for seconding that. Now the motion on the floor is to approve both sets of minutes. Uh, everyone by voice, um, voice vote. Uh, yay. If you approve. Yay. Okay. Any opposition by saying nay? Okay, I see no opposition. So the minutes have been approved unanimously on both accounts. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're gonna move to the new business. And first up is LR 1296, the Hartford County Alcoholic Beverage Subpoena Authority. Uh, we have here to testify. Um, and since uh, the liquor board is in opposition of this particular legislation, we'll have them go last. Uh, so we have um, Mr. Joe Snee here, uh, who is in favor of this particular legislation and also in your packet for the delegation. And um, we have um, some amendments or edits that Mr. Snee had put in as well. So you have those in your packets and I'm sure he will mention those in his testimony. So Mr. Snee, you're on. 
Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the delegation, Joseph F. Snee, Jr. Uh, I've done liquor board work for 38 years. And in my practice, I'm unable to subpoena records and um, other documents from protestants in hearings, many of which take a day, eight hours or more. And this would as an attorney for 38 years to issue a subpoena for what, what I need to prepare for a, he, uh, a hearing. It's no different than going to district court or circuit court. And the way the legislation was written, was not good, it would be in the discretion of the board, which when you go to court, it's not in the discretion of the court to issue a subpoena, it's in the discretion of me to issue a subpoena. So all I'm doing is adopting the civil procedure of the state of Maryland that goes back for years in order to fully prepare for a hearing. Uh, protestants come into liquor board hearings, they complain that you know, their um, balance sheets are going to be affected, but they will not, you know, yield their financial results. And uh, this simply gives me a way to compel witnesses and compel uh, documents so I can see them in preparation for a hearing, which is due process under the law. It's basic, basic due process. And that's all this bill does. The liquor board currently has the subpoena authority. I do not. And um, I, I just want an equal playing field. That's all I want, due process constitutionally. Okay, thank you, Mr. Snee, on that. Um, now we have, I believe, I'm not sure if it's gonna be Paul or Mike from the liquor board. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, did, I, I guess the first question I have is that the delegation received a letter of um, non support for this particular part. Yes, they have. Okay, and then I guess the main thing that came out of this was whether or not um, the intent was to subpoena personal and or business financial records of licensees, which currently are privileged information as far as the board is concerned. Those documents that are contained are in a secure location within the board's um, purview and are not released uh, and not used in any of the board's hearings. They're used during the application process. During the application process, the applicants submit a plethora of information, both personal that deals with their personal banking information and showing that they financially can afford um, to uh, operate the business, that in some cases that they put in an initial investment, a significant initial investment and where those monies come from. And from looking at this, it appears as though the intent is to show that the um, to be able to subpoena those records, including financial records of the businesses, is to show that they're another, another applicant that wants to either upgrade a license or wants to put a location in is not going to be harmed by financially impacting the current licensees. And that is troubling to the board that that information could be disclosed. I mean, they're in the business records, it could be not just financial plans, but their business model, um, how they uh, operate. Uh, and that's the concern of the board. Uh, speaking on behalf of the board and uh, trying to wrap my head around why that information would be necessary uh, is, is difficult. So uh, I will leave it at that part and would open any other questions from the participants. Okay, thank you, Mr. Krabs. Um, also, we received, um, I was wanted some more information on this bill myself, so contacted the um, legislative librarian and to ask her if there are any other counties actually have something similar to this. And she did send that information uh, late yesterday because um, we just asked for it a couple of days ago. And um, so we will provide that to the delegation as well. 
Um, there are 11 other counties in the state that have similar legislation. I haven't had time. And of course, the delegation does not have that yet either um, to look to see if it's similar to what Mr. Snee had um, put in um, or if it's different. I don't know. Um, Mr. Snee, have you seen this legislation or did you draft this from another county? I, yes, De Delegate Riley, um, Madam Chair, I um, based it off two counties. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of 11 total, but it's it's two counties that I drafted it from. And I think one was Anne Arundel, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, Anne Arundel is on the list um, that, that does have similar legislation. Okay, all right, um, thank you. And I see a question from um, Vice Chair McComas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just just briefly, Mr. Snee, um, I guess what I'm kind of concerned about is um, a possible chilling effect for people to come and and um, you know express their concerns to the liquor board, similar to like a slap suit, where um, you know all of their personal information and everything kind of comes out. Uh, that that's a, a concern that I have. Um, if you were representing the person that wanted to go forward with the um, with the proposal to, to open a liquor store or a bar or a restaurant. Um, and I guess my, my other concern is that, um, you know, I respect that you copied it from, let's say, Anne Arundel County, but they may have a, every, every county has a different liquor, um, liquor board kind of uh, management, different liquor laws. I mean, the, the, the liquor bills are incredible. Every, every, jurisdiction does it differently. So I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of concerned that maybe we're, because things are moving very fast down here, maybe maybe this is something that maybe needs to go to summer study for the delegation as well as the liquor board and be able to look at these things uh, because we have a deadline of, of next Thursday. So just some thoughts on that, if you, if you would give me your thoughts. Okay. Sure, I've practiced in all those jurisdictions. I've done liquor board cases and all those. Uh, there's four volumes to the alcoholic beverages law. There's over my left shoulder behind me. I know them well. Um, we're not talking about slap suits, delicate McComas, not at all. All I want when I go to a hearing, which is contested, and these aren't restaurants, by the way, they're liquor stores. What happens is you file an application and every licensee in Hartford County that has an existing license opposes you. And all I want is the ability for due process to prepare for that. I don't do protestants work. Um, I, I've never done it and I never will. So uh, I, I just think all it does is open up a fair playing field so I can be prepared when I go to court, which is the liquor board. The last hearing we did on December 7th took eight hours and I didn't have the ability to look at records. And people were complaining, the competitors, that they were gonna be negatively affected by uh, a new licensee. And it's like, well, show me the records and, and they won't do it. Uh, so uh, summer study, I know that's the committee of death. So if we're gonna act on this, we, we need to do it this, this session. Okay, thank you. And I see another question from uh, Delegate Steve Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Snee, I, I see the way this is written on page two, paragraph A, that in connection with any hearing before the board, the board in its discretion may subpoena witnesses or records on behalf of a license holder, a prospective license holder, or an attorney representing a license holder or a prospective license holder. Um, is that being done now and do they have the ability and do they get you the records you need? No, it's not being done, Delegate Johnson, and that's why I suggested that may should be changed to shall if I ask for it. Uh, so I've never been able to get that ever in 38 years of practice. Have you attempted through the board? Oh, sure. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank You're you, Delegate. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Yes. And that is one of the edits that uh, Mr. Snee had in there. And then also that um, Part B he had issued, he's going to, um, the subpoena shall be 
um, substantially in the form of a subpoena and then cross off issued by the circuit court of Harford County. So Mr. That's Queen, those, those two edits you still are looking for in the bill, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All righty. Do I see any other questions on this particular bill? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Ms. Adelka Johnson, you're good. Uh, your hand is still up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Chair, uh, I couldn't get my hand raised for some reason on the screen. Okay. Real All right. Quick, you have to follow up. Yes, ma'am. That was that was part of the problem we had when the verbiage was changed because it, it because it took the discretion away from the board to be able to see whether or not the request was reasonable and justified based on the circumstances. So when the two changes that came in gave now orders that they shall be done. That's a, that's a, that's a not a, there's no discretion there. That's okay. a, it takes the discretion of the board away. So in order. Part of the issue was that if they would come before the board and the board felt that the it was reasonable for them to consider it, um, then they may. However, uh, that verbiage change took the discretion completely away from them to find out whether they believed the request was reasonable. Okay. All right. Um, and Delegate Johnson, your hands back up. Yes, Madam Chair. Those questions for the board. Uh, how often do you get those requests and how many times have you provided records for the requestee? To respond, right now we don't get those requests. What we do is we have the ability to subpoena witnesses before the board and then they can be cross-examined or examined by any council that's present, um, including questions from the board and the board's attorney if necessary. But if there's witnesses that are necessary to be um, summons or subpoenaed for hearing, the board already has that ability. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Okay. Um, again, this bill was just being heard this week. So obviously we're not going to be voting on um, any of the um, amendments that Mr. Sneed had put in from the original bill or actually on the bill. So we will see this bill again um, back next week. So thank you um, all those that came in to testify on LR 1296. We're going to move now to LR 1791, Local Government Health Harford County Advisory Plumbing Board. And we have the Director of Inspections, Licensing and Permits here, um, Rich Truitt. Okay, and uh, Mr. Truitt, is going to explain and introduce um, this particular bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the delegation. Good morning. Um, my name is Rich Turner. I'm the D Director for Inspections License Permits for Hartford County. Uh, it, unbeknownst to us, uh, recently the Law Department for Hartford County made me aware back in about July that there was a conflict between state law and our local provisions for the plumbing board. As you can see in the section that's being advised, we're asking for the uh, section to be stricken out, which talks about the advisory plumbing board shall consist of a physician, a plumber, and one other individual to assist in the drafting and adoption enforcement of the plumbing code. Our current local legislation establishes the board um, as appointed by the county executive and the county council and consists of the health officer or their designee three master plumbers and a depart the such department heads who shall be responsible for the enforcement of the plumbing code. So we're asking that this legislation be modified so that it gives us the ability to be back in line with state law, but also be uh, allow us to stay consistent with our current legislation. So I'm willing to ask it, answer any questions that the delegation may have. Thank you, Mr. Truitt. Okay, um, do we have any questions from the delegation? Wow. Okay. Hold on one second. I've got to let Cindy back in. Okay. Um, seeing none, I just have one for Mr. Truitt. So this particular um, legislation obviously came from uh, straight from you as director of the license uh, inspections, license and permits. Um, is this something that the uh, county administration uh, approves of and agrees with as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And basically the only thing it's doing is putting us in line with what we're currently doing in Harford County and yes, lining us up with the state. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. You're welcome. 
Okay, and again, I guess, um, so we just keep with the same, uh, the same um, process. We're gonna hold this one again um, until next week. Oh, I see you have a question, Delegate Johnson. Uh, yeah, the question's that, for you. That was late. <laughs> for you, Madam. Well, this question's for you, Madam Chair. Okay. This, this one is, nobody has any questions. It's pretty straightforward and it's just putting us inconsistent with uh, line with the state. Can we go ahead and vote on this one and knock this one out? I could, but if we do that, then there might be some other ones and I just don't want to um, hold us up because of time constraints, time constraints and all the bills are due next week. And I want to make sure that all the people here on the liquor bills, we, we get those done. So right, thank you. Madam. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh. Okay, um, so now we're going to move to old business. And the, we're going to start with LR 1316. And this one, we have heard uh, somewhat about it, but we kind of got um, cut off a little bit and ran out of time. So um, we're, we have the liquor board is in, um, has additional information on this particular bill. And then we have additional written testimony from Jack Graham, which is also with us here this morning. So I'm gonna give them uh, both a little bit of time quickly um, to explain their new information that they may want to provide. So once again, uh, since Mr. Graham is here in support of this particular legislation, I'm gonna have Mr. Jack Graham uh, briefly um, express his additional information on this particular uh, legislation and how it would help his industry. Thank you, Delegate. Um, a request was made during the previous meeting to uh, ask about our total liquor sales. Um, I was able to provide that to the county, which I believe delegates have received. Total liquor sales, inclusive of sales tax and liquor tax for the calendar year 2022 was $371,237.63. Um, after tax, that would be three hundred forty thousand five eighty four, uh, which effectively makes our current ten thousand dollar liquor license fee an additional three percent, uh, two point nine percent for the sake of accuracy, um, uh, cost associated with that. Uh, again, you know, we are just trying to get something that's uh, fair compared to other counties who are paying one fifth or one fourth of what we're paying. Um, we are by no means selling hundreds of thousands of tickets. Uh, we, we announced 120,000 fans this year of which uh, approximately 15 to 20% were free tickets. We had a handful of non-baseball events this year aside from the 66 baseball games. We are a small local business that really doesn't operate the way that restaurants or bars or other venues do 365 days a year or close. Um, and we're just trying to create a, a par level with the rest of the counties, uh, stadiums uh, of our size. Okay, thank you, Mr. Graham. Do I see any questions from the delegation? Okay, see none and everybody has that um, written testimony in your packet. Uh, now we have um, either Mike Krebs or Paul Radewski. Good morning again. Uh, as the letter, the delegation got the follow up letter from the liquor board and its stance, um, there were a couple of issues that we developed. One was Ripken Stadium or RS Concessions is not like the other stadiums that we refer to in the letter. RS Concessions is the only one that is in the class of baseball in that group for minor league baseball that, in addition to beer and wine, has the ability to sell liquor. They also have as part of their licensed facility, the entire parking lot. Even though Mr. Graham says, well, we don't hold a lot of events there, we don't serve out a there. They have the ability to do that. They're the ones that choose to or not to do that. Um, so those are the big difference. And if you look at the stadiums that do have the ability to sell beer, wine, and liquor, the annual license fee for those locations is a significant amount higher than what Ripken Stadium's currently or Bars Concessions is currently paying. And the $10,000 fee was the one that was originally proposed by RS Concessions when they came before the board with the application to get a license and to get this class license in Hartford County. So now to come back and say, well, we just want to be on the level playing field with all the other stadiums. We understand that, but that's not exactly a true statement. The rest of the stadiums don't have the same opportunities that RS Concessions has. In addition, if you look at the math again, we talked about, I use Mr. Graham's figures. And if you looked at Mr. Graham's figures based on what the 
ticket sales are, not the ones that they give away. Again, it's entirely up to them how they manage that. But their, their sales themselves, if I can refer to my letter very quickly, as an indication that their total revenue um, is significantly, uh, would support, let's put it that way, it's better off, would support um, remain, the fee remaining the same for their liquor license. And if you figure out prior to COVID, they were doing 38 games a year. Um, now they're, the 2022 season is projected for 66 baseball games a year, which is the opportunity when they apparently sell their most uh, alcoholic beverages and have the opportunity to do that. Based on the ticket sales alone, have nothing to do with concession, nothing to do with alcohol sales. The ticket sales alone, based on Mr. Graham's own projections that he supplied to the board, is that their, their revenue on ticket sales alone will increase by $860,160. That's by his numbers that he provided to the board. So again, the board is opposed to any decrease in license fees. We believe the license fee is appropriate for the opportunities that our concession has to use that license at its facility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krabs. And quickly, uh, Mr. Graham, real quick follow-up. Sure, thank you. Yeah, um, assuming that we're gonna go from 38 games to 66 and have a proportional increase in ticket sales is mis uh, misguided. Anyone who's worked in sports knows that just because you're playing more games doesn't mean more people will attend the games. Um, certainly I can respect that there's a, a conceptual proportional increase that people could imagine, but we sold the same amount of tickets in 2022 uh, that we did in 2019, which was 38 games pre-pandemic. So the concept of that is, is not accurate. So uh, assuming 860,000 additional tickets is simply not true. Uh, additionally, when the board suggests that other facilities that can serve beer, wine, and liquor have higher fees than even we do, uh, that would be true, but those facilities are Oriole Park at Camden Yards and M&T Bank Stadium where the Ravens play. And so uh, M&T Bank has approximately 11 times our uh, capacity and the Orioles have approximately five times our capacity and they are NFL and MLB stadiums. Um, we did suggest a higher fee than the other minor league stadiums because, <clears throat> because we can serve liquor. We did feel that that was fair, which is why we asked for a $4,000 fee and not a $2,400 fee like uh, I believe uh, Prince George's County or a $2,000 fee like Wicomico. We were trying to compromise on that. We were trying to be fair and equitable and we appreciate the consideration on that particular topic. Okay, thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question for the Liquor Board. Um, do you guys have a surplus in your budget? You have to unmute. Mr. Krabs, or we can't hear you. You need to unmute. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I was trying to find my hand button again. It's very yes. easy yes, to Mr. see Krabs. when it's 10 feet away from me. I was asking, do you does the liquor board have a surplus in their budget? That would be a discussion that really needs to take place because there's some, I believe, some misconceptions in how the the budget is viewed. And I don't know that we have the time to talk about it here. To answer your question directly, the surplus, if the, the, the fees that come in for next year's licensing fees are shown in this year's budget, which are an issue, which looks like a surplus, when actually it's not. We run very, very close to the budget every year. Um, and that's the reason that it needs another, that topic should be discussed in a different forum versus this forum, if that's beneficial. Okay. The reason I ask, because I don't think the model we're looking for in our county is the more a company makes, the more they should pay for liquor license. I don't think that's the model that we want to go down that road. But I wanted to bring that up. But thank you. And if you could, if you could um, let me know that, let the delegation uh, know that about the surplus, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Johnson. Okay. Do I have any other questions? Okay. I see. I, I have one more uh, comment to make. Um, I just want to point out that um, some of the Ironbirds had the ability to have a lot more events. Um, uh, right here we have their, they just announced for the first annual winter warmer event, um, which they're hosting on March 11th um, to serve uh, stouts, porters, lagers, and more from local breweries. They have the ability to hold a lot more events, which will um, cost us time and money to um, 
That's what I'm looking for to, um, to inspect and um, manage this. We are currently, the board has in the past um, had two liquor inspectors, um, but due to operating in the negative, past chairs have not um, filled a, a past um, inspector seat because we have been trying to um, operate in the black and not in the red um, and not hired a, another inspector. So um, with the more events they add, and they have the ability to add a ton of events um, with their license. Um, it, again, in past discussions, we've been told, well, we're not, we're comparing apples to apples with other licensees, but we're not. We're, we're comparing apples to pizza with this licensee when we compare them to other stadiums in the other counties, other jurisdictions. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, Delicate McComas, it's a question. Bob, you have to un uh, Okay, real, real quick. Um, I'm assuming that the $10,000 um, yearly fee um, has is what was originally set and has been, gone through the whole time, correct? So correct. I guess I guess what I'm kind of wondering is, is how long has Ripken Stadium been there? How many years? This is our, this is our 22nd year. We, we didn't get to play baseball in, in uh, 2020, so 21 seasons will be this year. Okay. So, you know, inflation's gone probably significantly up for those 21 years. So I'm just saying that the fact that it stayed the same and they haven't raised it when a lot of other, other taxes have been raised um, is maybe a good thing. Um, I just, that, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair McCormick. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so we are going to move on to, and thank you, uh, Mr. Graham, and also to the Liquor Board. And we're gonna move to LR 1361, which is the um, alteration of license quota. And we have the Liquor Board here as well. We have, um, a couple, several um, witnesses to testify. So I guess on this one, we're going to start with uh, Jay Risling from Silver Spring Mining Company. Is he here? Okay. Don't see Jay. Cindy, do we see Jay? I do not see him. Okay. All righty. So we have written testimony from Mr. Snee, he's, he's still on the line and would like delegate, to say something. Delegate Riley, there is someone on here named uh, JGR, but I don't know if that's- That's, that's probably he's, him. Could be. Yeah. So, so he's, he's on here, but he's muted. Okay. Um, Mr. Risling, can you unmute if you're here and show your face? <laughs> okay. We'll move on to the next witness and maybe he'll come on afterwards. So, uh, Mr. Snee, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, I'll adopt by reference my written testimony, but I will add to that uh, that I don't care if there are 34 authorized but unissued licenses, which is the case in Hereford County right now, uh, changing the threshold 3,000 to 4,500 will not change the dynamic of a liquor board case. If there's only one um, on the shelf, um, everybody in Harford County will oppose it if I represent somebody seeking to have it. Um, in addition to that, what's not <clears throat> understood is when you go to these trials, which they are trials, and like I said previously, the last one was eight hours, you have to have expert witnesses, testimony, and market, and you have to prove that in order to issue this license, the board needs to know it's going to accommodate the public and there's need. And these are very, very high standards to prove. And I just want um, the delegation to understand that this will not change anything. It, it just won't. And what's gonna happen is if we go from 34 to one, and if I apply for the one, everybody's going to oppose me. The last liquor board hearing I did took eight hours and I had 13 protestants. They were existing licensees from all over the county. 
they didn't even share the same market as the person I was representing. So that's all I'll say, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Snee. Uh, now we're gonna move, we have the president of the um, MSLBA and also owner of Friendship Wine and Liquors, uh, Mike, I see you, you're on. Good morning Welcome. to the delegation and thank you for the introduction, um, Chairperson Riley. Um, so I guess uh, I'm going to need to respond to um, some of the testimony that's been said prior. Um, for the record, you know, I, I, some of you are aware I am president of MSLBA. I've been actively involved in that for a long time. But first and foremost, I am a uh, local business owner. I uh, employ 25 employees. My entire family works there full time. And um, regarding the protesting um, comments that were made, uh, I've been in business for 34 years. Um, anybody who's familiar with Abingdon, the four closest stores to me, which are Wine World, Beverage Barn, the uh, Edgewood Sunoco, and Festival Wine and Spirits. Uh, for the record, they are the four closest stores to me. I, I did not protest any of those. Uh, secondly, the December 7th hearing that was brought up, um, I did not testify or protest at that one. As a matter of fact, if they'd like to check the record, the last testimony that I provided was for Forest Hill Wine and Liquor, and I was there in support of that license. So I just want to get that clarified, and then we'll move on to the population or the amount of licenses and whether or not um, having 34 on the table would compel um, particularly the liquor board to issue them when there's such a surplus. Um, there are no licenses available in the neighboring Baltimore County, and I've got my own statistics um, that were provided to me by the Liquor Board, and Mike or Paul, please feel free to comment. In the last 10 years, excuse me, yeah, 10 years, um, the net total, 10 years of licenses that were either shelved, turned back in, or issued is plus one. There has been a total of one new license out of the total that existed 11 years ago, actually, um, in addition to what was there back in 2012. So um, the fact that there are 34 uh, on the table you know, is, it, you know, technically I could say it would be 340 years worth of licenses, uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I've done my own math in 34 years on, on how many have been plus or minus, but, you know, one versus 34 is, just it's it's not even close i'd like to take another minute to reflect or remind people of the growth of population okay for the last i went back 20 years did all the census reports and whatnot and the population uh for the last 20 years okay grew 19 percent and for the next 20 years okay it is projected to grow 11 percent so if anything theoretically there would be less you know there's there's going to be less licenses needed to be issued than there are people moving in versus the last 20 years. Um, so that, you know, that's all I wanted to say regarding this matter. And I think the figure of going to 4,500 uh, versus the 3,000 currently, just so everybody knows, this is probably the most important fact here. It's going to leave 12 licenses available. So if, we've, if we're plus one in 10 years, that's still over a century's worth of licenses that would be available. And I, I, again, I do think that having them available definitely affects a lot of the pro, you know, the, the, the hearings, the testimony, the lawyers get involved in this when they know that they're out there. There's just a lot of time and money. Sometimes you're wasted when, when really there's only been one new one and no total issued in 10 years. So thank you for your time and uh, I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Um, for, I guess, most of the delegations knows what your acronym, uh, MSLBA, but for the uh, folks that are listening online, would you like to explain what that is? Sure. Um, MSLBA is the Maryland State Licensed Beverage Association. Okay. Um, we are the largest, you know, organization for independent liquor store owners uh, or business owners in the, in the state of Maryland. Um, our, our, our real mission is just to sort of monitor le legislation, both locally and statewide uh, on an annual basis. Um, well, thank, and, uh, thank you, so yes, that's thank all. you yep. so much for what you do on that particular board. We, we do appreciate it. Um, now we're open up to questions. I see a question from Delegate Griffith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thanks, Mike, for coming out and, and speaking on the bill. Just one slight um, uh, 
correction on the, the numbers. So at 4,500, it would leave four outstanding licenses. At 4,000, it would leave 12. Uh, and I spoke to Mike, and he's certainly um, happy if we were to adjust it down to 4,000 to leave 12 outstanding licenses. I just Absolutely. want to make that one point of clarification. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Delegate Griffith. I'll see a question from Delegate Steve Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question for the Liquor Board. If you could get to the delegation, uh, they said that one license has been issued. If you could just let us know how many requests have been in the last 10 years, that would be helpful. Thank you, okay. Madam Chair. And you're welcome. And they'll be speaking here shortly. Um, so we also have in the audience, we have uh, Larry Dean, which is a business owner of Bel Air Liquors. And he had given us some written testimony, um, but I also believe he has a small amendment that he would like to speak about as well. So Mr. Dean, you're up. Oh, we lost you. Yep, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Mr. Dean, you need to unmute. Still muted. Mr. Dean, you could possibly hit your mute, your space Can you hear me now? There, Yes, you're good. Okay, sorry yes. about that. That's okay, thank you. Zoom calls are kind of new to me. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate some of the things that um, I have uh, included in the written testimony and that, um, you know, there's currently 54 licenses uh, issued in the, the county. And yes, there is 34 still available. And um, it's based upon one for every 3,000 people in population. That includes um, people under the age of 21. Um, the market is currently being um, uh, run at a, a ratio more like one for every 5,000 uh, people in the county based upon the number of licenses that are currently issued to the population. Um, you know, Mr. Sneeze always mentioned that, uh, hey, let's uh, issue them based upon what the market can bear. And um, yeah, historically, the, the market has been dictating it that um, the ratio is closer to one for 5,000 uh, people. Um, the request, uh, you know, to change the population ratio would permit and continue with the responsible sale and distribution of alcohol for adults over the age of 21. There's currently 95,000 households in this county. And um, Mr. Pat Ode, who is a expert witness from York College that Mr. Snee has uh, hired numerous times to represent, uh, stated that there's uh, $465 per year spent on alcohol sales for consumption at home. Um, so with 95,000 homes, <clears throat> that puts a market um, value of $45 million. And if you take 454 licensees that are currently in the marketplace, that only allows $833,000 per uh, licensee. If every license were issued, that would only allow $511,000 uh, per licensee. And one of the concerns that we have is that if and when there were ever um, chains permitted in the state with the current number of licenses that are on, on the table that, that could be issued, um, that would allow every grocery store um, and Walmart and uh, Target and big box retailer to get a license, which would have a devastating effect in the marketplace for the existing licensees in the county who've been um, following the rules and regulations of running their businesses for decades. And um, so it's, it's important to re remember that uh, the, the role of the Crawford County Liquor Board is to monitor and make sure that the sale and distribution of alcohol is uh, reasonable and uh, the rules and regulations are um, followed by the licensees. And, um, you know, we're in a highly regulated industry where we um, accept the rules and regulations. Um, you know, um, 
there's a three tier system, you know, the suppliers have to sell to distributors, distributors are protected by franchise rules and they have to sell to retailers, retailers, including bars and restaurants. And um, the state um, controls our credit terms. So with um, none of us are here to complain about the rules and regulations that we have to comply with. What we're here is to say, more isn't necessarily what's better for the industry or what's better for the public. You know, um, once again, we do um, our due diligence of complying with rules and regulations. We um, make sure our staff are trained and we, um, I, I think I speak for myself and a, a lot of the retailers in, in, in the, the county that um, um, nobody is in, in the business to um, circumvent the rules and regulations. And uh, we're just asking that the licensed to population ratio is uh, similar to um, counties that Harford County is uh, um, very similar to like with Baltimore County, it's one for every 4,000 people. And they have a moratorium that they can't license, they can't issue any more licenses currently. Carroll County and Frederick County, the same kind of thing. The, the um, number of uh, people per license is uh, in that four to 5,000 range. Um, so we're just asking that uh, Harford County adapt and um, do what is similarly done in other jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for coming on and giving your testimony. Um, I'm now open to questions. I do see, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Delegate McComas, is your question for, is for one of the folks that just testified or you want to wait until after the liquor board is done? Uh, well, I just want to ask Mr. Dean a, a, a quick question. Okay. Uh, my concern is um, underage drinking and the pro and kids getting kind of becoming alcoholics and because, you know, underage drinking is a problem. Also, so my question is, is if it's allowed in, let's say, big box stores like Walmart or the grocery stores, there's probably going to be less checking on IDs to get it. And um, it's just, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, isn't that so? <laughs> uh, I, I tend to agree with you because, um, you know, a lot of those stores have self-checkout. Um, they have people that uh, work for them that are uh, under the age of 21. And um, so then you also have people who are shopping in the stores uh, that are under the age of 21. And um, so, yeah, I, okay. I, I think there's opportunity for either in, internally where people have access to alcohol who are under the age of 21 or um, externally where there's people shopping. You know, everybody eats. And, and has to go to the store and buy food. Not everybody drinks. Alcohol is a, a, a substance that has been regulated and controlled for um, generations. Thank and um, Thank you, Larry. it should only have access to people over the age of 21. Yes, we do have to move on. Um, I see a question from Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Larry, you mentioned something that I wanna ask about. It's more along the economic lines of things. Um, the liquor stores, most of them sell lottery products. And I know that lottery is the third largest revenue generator for the state. Uh, you mentioned the, the grocery stores and Walmarts. If they started selling the alcohol, would do you feel that there'd be a decline in your customers and, and folks that played lottery? Oh, absolutely. So, so uh, my experience is that um, I, I've owned Bella Liquors for 25 years. I've been in the industry for 38 years. So... Um, years ago, you, you used to have to petition the state to get a, a, a lottery license and you had to prove that you could do X amount of sales. Now they have a uh, lottery available everywhere. And I've seen my lottery commissions go from um, $30,000 a year to $8,000 last year. So it, you know, it's my responsibility to take on any losses as far as cash shortages in the lottery, missing tickets and everything else. And then I have to provide the labor. So um, years ago, you know, 25, 30 plus years ago, uh, $30,000 a year was a significant uh, um, 
incentive to have the lottery. Now it, it's, it's, it, it won't even pay my electric bill. It doesn't even pay the payroll. So uh, more isn't better. Um, it might be better for the state that they might increase sales for them. But for the individual um, outlets, when you keep slicing the pie, our share keeps getting smaller and smaller. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank, thank you, Delegate Johnson. Um, I do want to mention that Delegate A. Johnson has to um, zoom off for a few minutes for another a previous appointment, and hopefully he will return. So thank you, um, Delegate Johnson. Uh, we're now going to move to um, the liquor board for their testimony on this particular bill. Please unmute yourself. Good morning again. Uh, the delegation should be in receipt of a letter from the board dated January 26th in reference to this particular proposal. Uh, we uh, did crunch the numbers and in fact, uh, what was alluded to earlier on the 10 year span that is correct that there is grace over the decade for A1 and A licenses. We do not, there, there, are, there is not a need and there are, we don't have any A2 licenses issued in the county. So that's the six day. Nobody wants to do a six day, everybody wants a seven day and it makes sense. To answer the um, other portion of the letter, the, the issue that we saw in the letter, we believe there was an error when the language was transferred over. So I'd like to have that looked at and well, the board would like to have that look at to see if they agree and that the recommendation for correcting the word um, on page two of the proposal, line eight, uh, from a, the word end to the word or. The word end leaves you to believe that you can issue additional licenses, not limiting it. The or means it's one of the three or not end afterwards. So that was the um, other recommendation. The recommendation from the board also was if the quota was to be changed based on the numbers, and we submitted that under attachment one, that the recommendation from the board uh, would be that they would agree to support this proposal uh, at the uh, quota number of 4,000 which we believe would leave a reasonable number of licenses available, uh, which is 12 versus four licenses available at the quota of 4,500. And to answer uh, Delegate John, Steve Johnson's um, question about the number of applications, in the last four years, there have been five applications for A1 licenses. Uh, of that, three were for new licenses, uh, and one of those three actually wound up getting an upgrade and then there was uh, two, uh, which included that upgrade. So there were uh, five total licenses that were submitted and one actually was denied out of that five. So that hopefully that answers his question on a number of applications, at least over the last four years. Okay, thank you so much. Do we see, uh, do I have any questions for the liquor board? Okay, seeing none. And thank you everyone for coming in and testifying. On that particular bill, we're going to move to LR 1485, and this is the class, um, the healthcare license. And we have, let's see, we have written testimony from uh, Keith and Kathy Rawlings in support of this particular bill. Um, everybody should have that in their packet, I believe. Uh, we have written testimony from Joe Sneed, um, and he also has an amendment that is needed. Um, with church and schools in reference to the distance between church and school. So, Mr. Sneed, if you're still on, you're up. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, so I do represent Keith and Kathy Rawlings. This would be for any uh, health care club, including the Arena Club, which they've owned. Um, so I support this legislation, as does Keith and Kathy, and you have their uh submission, which I adopt by reference. Uh, the reason I asked for an amendment was uh, since we're close to the college and there's a new church under construction, we'd be exempt from the normal thousand foot for school, 300 foot for church requirements. Uh, this is similar to back in the day the golf course license was exempt as well. It's been amended since, but uh, in any event, um, it's not unheard of to uh, 
amend those out. Uh, the healthcare club license for alcohol is based on the demand by Keith and Kathy's constituents. They're paying customers and um, they would like to see it done. It's not unheard of if you remember Beller Athletic Club back in the day, although they weren't issued the license, they had a restaurant known as Rafferty's, I believe, which was just part of the facility. So folks could get a uh, beer or wine afterwards after their workout. So uh, with that, I'll just leave it with the written comments subject to the amendment, which I would respectfully request that we eliminate the school distance and church requirements. Okay, thank you, Mr. Snee. Do I see any questions for Mr. Snee? Okay, seeing none, we will move on and um, see what we'll have. We don't really have anybody else here. So now we'll go to our control board. Good morning, ma'am. Um, the liquor board um, hasn't changed uh, the way we um, have viewed this license. We do strongly oppose um, uh, the creation of a new class of license for health clubs in Hartford County. Um, health clubs are supposed to promote healthy lifestyles. Um, alcohol has long been recognized by the medical community as a depressant and therefore does not promote a healthy lifestyle. Um, unfortunately, those individuals who overindulge tend to make choices they would not normally consider if they were not influenced by the consumption of alcoholic beverages. Um, additionally, the license proposed would afford the license the ability to serve beer, wine, and liquor uh, at the establishment. Um, we definitely uh, oppose removing the thousand foot rule um, from this license as well, as Mr. Snee just um, stated. Um, the last thing I wanna just leave with with this license is that if the delegation does decide to support this proposal, um, the Harvard County Liquor Control Board would like to recommend a license fee of no less than $3,500 given this license class would grant license to hold the ability to serve beer, beer wine, and liquor at the license location. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul, on that. And uh, now we're open for questions. I see Delicate Griffith. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. This is for the Liquor Board. Um, just one question about the testimony that your, your last testimony. So there's a number of bills in front of us that support liquor licenses for hundreds of other businesses. Um, that in some cases don't support a healthy lifestyle. I'm just not following the argument that well, a business who doesn't support a healthy lifestyle can sell alcohol, but a business that does support a healthy lifestyle can't. Um, especially when we're looking to blow wide open the amount of business to get these licenses. I'm just trying to, to follow that uh, argument. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Do we have a follow-up from- um, that, was, that was a question, that was a question. Yes, I know, so do we have um, someone want to respond from the would, board? I would like to um, ask for examples of what um, establishments that you're saying um, does not promote a healthy lifestyle. I also would like to point out that um, the health clubs also provide childcare. So you're gonna have alcohol service within establishments that provide um, childcare as well. Well, I mean, I would say, I would argue that, you know, what's the difference necessarily between a health club and ax in place or a health club and a restaurant that sells uh, cheeseburgers, for example. You know, I mean, they're not necessarily promoting an unhealthy lifestyle, but they're not necessarily promoting a healthy lifestyle either. So I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, squ to, to, to square that, that argument. That's all. The alcohol served in those locations um, is limited. Um, the, uh, we do have concerns regarding the health club's ability to establish appropriate safety and security plans for containing confining the alcoholic beverages to specific areas, locations within the licensed premises, and prohibiting the access of alcoholic beverages by underage individuals who often support and are patrons of these types of establishments. No, I appreciate it, thank you. Okay, thank Madam you. Madam Chair, if I could just address that. First off, mm -hmm. those rules are already baked into the law. 
So you have to control and enforce and card and so forth. There's five-year-olds at restaurants yeah. and it's no different than a healthcare club. So that argument just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, what we want to do is support business in Harford County. These folks have been around for years and their customers are demanding it. And I think the liquor board should be on our side and not opposed to us. Okay, thank you, Mr. Seen. And one more, uh, follow do I have a follow-up from the liquor board on that response? And we, we understand the uh, proposal. The dilemma is the venues that have been described are nowhere near similar to what a health club is. Restaurants, yes, young people can go into restaurants. They're there for a different reason. Health club environments in and of themselves are designed in, in a way to promote healthy lifestyles and the amount of children that are unsupervised running around through those facilities or left off in groups by themselves uh, is tremendous. So, you know, the, the way that we would have to, or the way the, license, the, the proposed licensee would have to control and contain that would have to meet the satisfaction of the board. And we're not sure based on the overall environment itself that they're going to be able to do that appropriately. Okay. There are also times when some of the other establishments do obviously serve underage individuals. We wouldn't have compliance details if that wasn't necessary. And right now the compliance details are necessary uh, and we're understaffed and we're trying to do the best we can with what we have. We're in the near future looking at starting cops and shops back up, which was a successful program in the past to help our licensees understand the importance of okay. not serving underage individuals. So we're looking at this as this, an, this is another opportunity that would present itself for those desiring to try to get served at an underage would have the ability to do that in an environment to where it's conducive to being healthy and not to the detriment. Um, we all know from starting out with a lot of the, unfortunately, the people that are addicted to substances often start with alcohol and then move on from there. So I'll end my comments at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we have a lot to consider here today. Um, Mr. And before I move on, Mr. Dean, could you please mute yourself? Oh, it hasn't been muted. <laughs> no. <laughs> so please do so. Thank you. Um, okay. So with that, I don't see anybody else testifying on that particular bill. So we're going to move on to, um, well, we have HB 120 on here. Um, and that one, I'm not sure if we have anyone from the school that wanted to send some additional information is on the line or not. Cindy, do you know? Can you repeat that question? If anyone- has Do we have any here uh, to testify on HB 120? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so we're going to move on, and we're on um, LR uh, 413, which is the Class L license. And we've heard from Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Phil Rudy um, a couple times. We've heard from the Liquor Board, um, and we already voted on the amendment. So, um, Mr. O'Neill, would you like to say anything before we go on and, and wait until next week to vote on all these? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair and delegation. Uh, we've covered the economic benefits of this proposed legislation, which is to allow for a Class L license for breweries, distilleries, and wineries in Hartford County. And just to highlight some of the points you made is it certainly has economic benefit for the county for promoting tourism and for bringing people to other parts of the county who might not visit to sample the different products that are being made. Uh, this is a legislation that is a response to the demand and the interest by our patrons and others. Uh, a little background, uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware, they already allow for their breweries, distilleries and wineries to sell other products and manufacturers from anywhere across the state. And in 2019, Allegheny County was the first county in Maryland to allow for the sale of other um, beverages from wineries, uh, breweries, and distilleries at their facilities within the county, but they can sell from any manufacturer across the state. 
So what we're proposing here is much more prescriptive bill to allow for Harford County manufacturers to sell products that are manufactured within Harford County. And uh, one thing I wanna point out is this is, would be a, certainly a small part of the business for these manufacturers. It's not gonna be the primary um, beverage that they'll be serving. It's not to their advantage for one thing to be selling somebody else's product instead of their own. Uh, I looked at a menu from a brewery in Pennsylvania, which the uh, human robot brewery, and they had at the very bottom of their menu, uh, noting stuff for people who really didn't want to come here. And so it is a small offering, but it allows for those who are uh, going to a brewery or a winery with some, with their friends or family who do not like the product being served there to have an option. And so we see this as just a, a positive thing for the community. It is uh, proposed in response to what the patrons want. And so we certainly ask for the support of the entire delegation uh, for promoting this bill once given the opportunity to vote on it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Okay, uh, quickly, do we have a, a response from the liquor board on this? I know you've spoken on it, but give you just a second. Please unmute. Yep. Yes, sorry. Um, again, we the liquor board does support this bill. And we do think it would be a great um, uh, addition for our community. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, seeing no, oh, do I have any questions from the delegation? No questions. We're going to move on to LR 572. <clears throat> this one, we do have additional uh, testimony from the liquor board. And we also have, I believe, Adam and Mike on the line as well. Um, so we will start with Adam. Uh, Madam Chair, the city still supports the bill. We don't have any new testimony. Thank you so much. And Mike, is he on the line? Oops. No. Okay. Um, I, um, okay, don't see any there. And so we do, I have see a question from uh, Delegate Griffith. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Is there any conversation around um, the proposed amendments by uh, the county executive in terms of uh, limiting, till, removing the portion after the performance and removing the portion allowing for uh, um, alcohol to be served for for uh, um, cast parties, things of that nature. Uh, my position on that is obviously afterwards, people should be leaving the venue and it then becomes a bar if it's not an actual activity going on. And then for obviously cast parties, you know, then you're taken away from local restaurants who should be receiving that business. So uh, I certainly support those uh, um, proposed Thank amendments. Just want to see if there's any thoughts from the, uh, the delegation on those. Okay, uh, we do have written testimony that the um, liquor board has given us on that. And I asked that question, I believe it was last week and uh, Mr. Krabs explained their view on that. Um, and then, so I will let them do that as well so that you can answer uh, Delegate Griffith. And also just to let everybody know, we still have the amendment from the actual liquor board on this legislation to change um, uh, page three, uh, line 11 G to where it says a business for which the license is issued. They would, they would like a change that um, would say the license holder. So we still have to vote on that change as well when we uh, go to vote on this bill. So just to bring that to the delegation's attention. And uh, Mr. Krabs, would you please uh, answer Delegate Griffith's question about the amendments or changes uh, that the county executive has suggested? Yes, Delegate. Um, I believe um, uh, Delegate Griffith was um, mistaken. The letter it, that he is referencing to is for LR 574 for the Performing Arts Theater license, mm -hmm. not the Arts and Entertainment license. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. So, uh, Delegate Griffith, that's coming up. <laughs> after one more bill. Okay, so do I see any other questions? Okay, no other questions. We will move forward to LR 573. And this one is the Barbershop Beauty Salon. Um, there's no one here to testify on this particular bill. Liquor Board, would you like to briefly explain your position so we can move on? 
unmute. <laughs> yes, I'm going to keep this quick. We do support this uh, bill. We supported it last year as well. Um, it would definitely help uh, the license or the establishments uh, in our county to become um, uh, lawful in, in what they are currently doing. Okay, and just to follow up on this one, I don't see any amendments that you oppose, I mean, that you put forth, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now we did have, I believe the county executive had a suggestion on this one as well. Page three, uh, line 17 through 19, number two is attending a fundraiser event at the barbershop uh, beauty salon for each county department of inspections, license of permits has uh, issued a permit. Do you, can you respond to that? We do support mm. that amendment. You support the amendment or, yeah. okay. Okay, Kasley, 17 through 19. Okay, all right. Do I see any questions from the delegation? See none, we will move on to LR 574. And this is the performing arts uh, theater license that Delegate Griffith was referring to. Um, Adam, would you like to say anything? Uh, Madam Chair, the city still supports the bill and we do not have any new testimony. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, as Delegate Griffith had mentioned, we have a suggested amendment from um, our county executive, we have those in the bill. There were uh, two spots where he had wanted something removed. And so if the liquor board could um, address those, we would appreciate it. Uh, we believe that the bill is adequate as written. Um, the performing arts theater license was specifically designed to support Harford County. Uh, specifically in half the grace, the number of per diem licenses that they were applying for was greater than, uh, which would be less, it would be more practical for them under this class of license and be less costly to them to get to pay the fee under this class of license than currently they are spending on their per diems. Last year, I believe they spent 13 or 1850 um, total for licenses. Uh, and this would allow them to hold the events at a less cost. It also saves the staff here of having to process the per diem licenses um, and bringing them before the board, getting them approved each time. So the, the overall cost savings is, is twofold. It's a savings to the board by not having to have the staff process all the licenses and it's a cost sa savings uh, would be to the licensing. Okay. Thank you. Do I see any other questions from the delegation? Okay, seeing none, um, I, uh, Cindy, is um, Jay uh, Risling on the line still? We failed to go back to him on um, LR 1361. I do not see him on I here. Keep, I keep seeing right. him going back and forth. I don't know if he's having trouble getting in. Mm. Madam Chair, could I say one more I don't thing? currently see him. About okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. Can, can I say one more thing real quick about the performing arts license before we move forward? Yes, please. Okay, the, the county executive's uh, request to propose the following amendment and remove the after performance on page three, remove E4 during a cast party or reception before after performance. That was specifically requested by the performing arts uh, theater and have a grace that they be allowed to, to have it at those particular times because that's when they believe um, it is appropriate for them to be able to serve uh, during and after and during these, these particular uh, events that occur at their establishment. So at their request, it was included in the original proposal. Okay. And we would support that to continue to remain in the proposal. That's, that's the point. Okay. And I am familiar, and there are other theaters in other counties that um, that is, you know, when they actually serve the alcohol before and after, um, would you, you know, would there be a compromise to say maybe just before and not after to kind of, you know, answer the question from Delegate Griffith? 
you know, after the performance, they should be, you know, heading out and heading home. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Adam, would you like to respond to maybe that that possible amendment? Um, I, I haven't seen that amendment. Can I get back to you next week on that? Sure, sure. I'll come back with an answer. Okay, so um, are you so you're familiar with um, the county executive suggestion in that section of the bill on page three? Yes, ma'am. Like, okay, so um, possibly maybe could you consider, you know, maybe keeping the before, but then removing the after okay. performance? I, I, I'll, I will reach out to the arts collective too and uh, speak to them about this. Okay, all right, Chair, thank you very um, much on that. I'm sorry. Currently, the establishments under the per diem license that they currently get uh -huh. are provided the ability to serve before and after. That's a part of their per diem licenses. What they would have to do then is even though they're licensed, they would also have, have to submit a per diem and then they would be allowed to do it um, anyways. Mm. Okay. So, so they would have two licenses. They'd have, a per, they'd have to do a per diem license plus already have an established license um, for the events. Okay, so you're saying we either strike um, lines two and three completely, or we can't change it? Um, I, you, you can change it. it. It would still allow them, they would, they would just have to continue to do per diem licenses for these events. It would actually remove the benefit of them having the license. That's what, that's what's going to give me my next question, then why, you know, yeah, th right. It would it would it would be of no benefit for them to then apply for this license. You just continue okay. to do per, per dams. Okay. And that was the whole intent was to give them a benefit to have the benefit of the license, the annual license. Okay. Versus so maybe maybe um, the administration wasn't aware that that's that currently they can operate in this fashion. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and so I believe. Uh, we still don't have Mr. Rawlings uh, Risling on the line. So I think we are actually finishing up our agenda and it's going to give our delegation time enough to, uh, to not have to run over to the floor this morning. And just please be aware uh, to the delegation. Um, we need your answer on the appointees for um, the county executives appointees for the liquor board. Uh, that is due by Monday at noon with the delegations and the delegation secretary's uh, email so that we can get that out. And you have a lot to look over between now and Thursday. Next week's meeting will start um, again at 830 because we have a lot of bills to vote on. And when you're looking through your materials, make sure you know that the amendments that we will have to vote on and then also the actual bill. So we have we have several on all of those. We'll try to make that very clear to you um, for the agenda next week and thank our guest and to uh, spending time with us this morning and the past three Thursday mornings. And thank you for your testimony. And, um, you know, if you need to reach out to members of the delegation individually, you're welcome to do so. So thank you so much for joining us. And we will hopefully maybe see some of you back next week. So I need a motion to adjourn. Vice Chair McComas is waving her hand. So move, okay. so move. Do I have a second? I can't do it. <laughs> uh, I see Della Griffith is still on. Can you give us a second to, okay. <laughs> we have a second. Okay, thank you everyone and see you next week.